When I was seven years old, I contracted spinal meningitis. I was barely old enough to understand how close to death I was because of the disease I had, let alone did I have a clue what was about to happen to me during treatment. My mother took me to the hospital and told the doctors to do whatever they needed to do to save my life. They required a spinal tap before continuing treatment. The look on my mother's face when they said that told me everything I needed to know, despite the fact that I had no idea what a spinal tap was. I remember my mother pleading with the doctors to find some way to make the procedure less traumatic for me, but for some reason they couldn't put me under general anesthesia. Instead, they offered a new experimental treatment on humans at the time, intravenous ketamine. My mother had never heard of the drug before, and my father wasn't there. They explained that it was traditionally used as a horse tranquilizer, but had recently been approved for use in humans. Even the pediatric care. Ever since, my mom swears up and down that's all they told her about it. Maybe it was a time-sensitive case. Or maybe the doctors thought if they told her everything that was involved with being under the influence of the drug, then she would refuse to let me have it, which in their minds would make the spinal tap harder to go through. Frankly, it boggles my mind that doctors would even consider giving ketamine to a child, but that's what happened. They wheeled me into the operating room and told me what was going to happen, that I would have to lay on my side and they would insert a needle into my back, which would feel extremely uncomfortable. I know that's what they said now, but at the time I was so disoriented and scared and even confused that it all sounded like gibberish. Like how adults sound in Charlie Brown when they just go, wah, 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 if you know what I mean. All the doctors and nurses were wearing masks and gowns too, which made them look almost inhuman. I had to get naked and put on a hospital gown, adding to the stress of it all because I had to be exposed to a bunch of strangers. The only thing that kept me sane was that my mother was allowed to be there with me so I could hold her hand. However, before they did the tap, they inserted the IV needle into my arm to deliver the ketamine. I cried and screamed, and I remember squirming, just from having that needle put in me, and I didn't even understand how much bigger the next one would be. Then they turned me over to my side and I held my mother's hand, squeezing harder than before, looking into her eyes and crying and trying to be brave and sit still. At first, all I could feel on my back was the cold hospital air, but then something happened. Everything started to feel weird. Of course, I know now that this was the ketamine beginning to take effect, but I didn't understand this at the time. An all-encompassing dread washed over my body, which I also felt like I was losing control of. Like my soul was slipping away second by second. Then. It literally did feel like I was dying and rising up to heaven. I was lifted up from the table and could see my own body and everyone around, and what I saw filled me with a mixture of terror and hatred. The doctor was lining up the needle up against my back, and for the first time, I saw how massive the thing was. And there was my mother, watching it all happen, letting them do it. Suddenly, I knew I couldn't go through with it anymore. I screamed and kicked and punched at everything around me hell-bent on getting off of that table and running away. The nurses tried to hold me down, but they were struggling to keep me contained. Somebody called for more help, and that's when two gigantic, muscular nurses rushed and grabbed a hold of me, then pinned me down to the table, along with four or five other people. My mother was crying in the corner now. Apparently, I had hit her in the face. I could still see everything that was going on around me, and the IV drip was still feeding me ketamine straight to my blood which went directly to my brain. Now all the masked and gowned doctors and nurses didn't look human at all. They looked like monsters. Demons, even. Sick, twisted, demented creatures that my mom had sold my soul to. And now they were forcibly extracting my soul from my body with that horrible needle. I looked to my mother with bitter contempt and screamed that I hated her for letting this happen to me. It only made her cry harder, no matter how hard I fought back. Once they all got a hold of me, I couldn't even squirm. They held me down and finished the spinal tap. When the needle went into my back, it felt like I was being torn apart from the inside. And because I was moving so much, waves of pain shot through my body. Finally, I accepted that I just had to sit still, but it was awful. 
I could feel my essence being drained, something I would never get back. Thankfully, after a few seconds, it was over, but I wasn't the same. I didn't move for hours after that, and I wouldn't talk to my mother or even look at her. Being drugged and having a needle shoved into my spinal cord as a child is easily the most traumatic thing I've ever experienced in my life. And the stupid thing I hate the most about it is the fact that it was all just to confirm what the doctors basically already knew, that I had spinal meningitis. When I was a teenager, there was an old abandoned hospital that had been built in the 1800s, long since replaced and left to rot. It couldn't be torn down as it was a historical site, but it also couldn't be repurposed and ever since it was condemned, Nobody took it upon themselves to be the caretaker of the place. Security was basically non-existent, so it became a rite of passage in my neighborhood to hop the fence on Halloween and explore the ruins. Finally, the time came when my friends and I got the bug, and we knew we were going to be the next to do it. We didn't even bother to wear costumes. Nobody wanted to go trick-or-treating or go to a party. The coolest party in town was me and my friends on the roof of the old hospital. All we needed to do was figure out a way up and avoid the numerous hazards along the way. The rumors of which were boasted about to a great extent by all the people who had already gone through it. From broken glass, rusty nails, squatters, to trapdoors, collapsing ceilings, and even ghosts supposedly. Understandably, we were all a bit nervous, but excited too. It was the coolest thing any of us had ever done and it seemed like there was even an entire path laid out for us by the people who did it before. The door at the front entrance was already broken open. We just stepped right inside undeterred. Immediately on the first story was a triage center. It was too dark even with our flashlights to see very far down the hallway, but the staircase was right there. Not too much was happening down on that level, so we opted not to bother exploring the bottom and moved on to the second of three stories. The ceiling had collapsed in on itself at the landing of the second story, so we went out from there to look for another stairwell. The second story was somehow even darker. The floor beneath our feet was soft and felt like it could cave in at any moment, so we spread out to distribute our weight. We thought we were being smart, staying quiet but pointing out all the things we noticed, like piles of old medical waste. Strange stacks of beds blocking off certain doorways we dared not even think of entering. Signs that had indicated what had been what so we could get a picture of how the place might have looked in its prime. It certainly was far from it by the time we arrived. Mold grew up the walls, vine snakes through the ceiling tiles, and water dripped from the third floor. And every single sound we made echoed in such a way that made it sound like a stranger was whispering around every corner. We kept saying how cool we found everything, but deep down, I think we were all scared. The last thing any of us wanted was for a crazy hobo to jump out at us for invading his home, or for one of the many ghost stories about the supposedly haunted hospital to somehow turn out to be true. Even decades after it had closed, and even to naive and careless boys like us, we could literally feel the lingering presence of the suffering and damned souls that had perished in the place we were trespassing. However, the only thing that lived there seemed to be rats and flies, but not nearly as many as we were expecting. After a few more minutes of checking things out, we finally reached the other side of the building and found another stairwell. This one went all the way up to the roof. Once we stepped in the damp concrete tube, we could hear and feel the outside air blowing in through an open door or a hatch. Whichever one it was, we were dying to know picked up our pace as we went up the stairs, excited to see the view. We barely noticed the moss that was growing on the steps, which slickened the grip we had under our shoes. Finally, at the very top of the stairwell, there it was, the open door. At the landing before it, we all paused to take a mental image of the site. As luck would have it, the moon was shining right through it. If any of us had brought a camera, it would have made a legendary photo. At last, it was only a moment of appreciation before we all wanted to finish our journey. Out of the four of us, I was the last in line at the stairs. A friend of mine was leading the pack as we all went up in single file. We were just seconds away, 
But then, the last thing we could have expected happened. Out of nowhere, a flurry of bats exploded from a nest that we hadn't seen. My friend at the top got startled and slipped on the moss and fell back, causing a chain reaction that led us to all fall like dominoes. Three of my friends landed on top of me, and my head crashed right onto the concrete. That's the last thing I remember before waking up in a real hospital. I cracked my head right open. I fractured my skull and my friends had to carry me all the way out of that abandoned wreck and get help for me. My family had to tell me a hundred times before I could finally accept that's what happened. Sadly, it seemed that none of us managed to get to the roof of the abandoned hospital like we had hoped that night. But I'm glad I had good enough friends to help me out when I needed it. To this day, a lot of people don't believe me when I say that's exactly what happened and why I fell. They say bats don't stay in their nests at night. But I guess even nocturnal flying mammals like to sleep in sometimes. I'm not an expert, it's just what I saw. I was a nurse for over 40 years. I spent the majority of my career in hospitals, working in the ER in my earlier days and later transferring to the ICU. I've seen a lot of horrible things happen to people and built up a strong stomach for all sorts of things. There are a thousand stories I could tell, but one above all is the worst thing I ever witnessed. It happened in my first year of working in the ICU, and I still don't have an explanation for it. Before he fell under my care, a man showed up in the ER with strange symptoms. Delirium, vomiting, and what appeared to be first-degree burns all over his body. They thought it was caused by a chemical at first, which led them to believe they needed to cleanse his skin and purge his system. However, when they tried to wash his skin, it just came off. What had looked like a first-degree burn was actually just the tip of the iceberg, an iceberg of total tissue disintegration. At this point, the ER team had no idea what they were dealing with. This was decades ago, long before the internet. The man refused to answer any questions about what happened to him, and he had no forms of identification in his possession. It was like he had just been dumped there. However, the doctors eventually figured out that the man was suffering from acute radiation sickness. But the dose he received and the severity of his case was still unknown. All we knew was that it was bad and he probably wouldn't survive. He was transferred to the ICU and that's when I met him. I knew it wouldn't be long before it would be impossible to get any information out of him, even if he wanted to tell us anything. So every time I did anything for him, whether it was changing his IV or getting his vitals, I berated him with questions. I asked for his name, if he had any family, and how he had been dosed with radiation, if he had any idea how much he had received, but he didn't answer many of my questions. The only thing he really ever said to me, and apparently the only thing he ever said to anyone was, I wish they would have just shot me. It was like the words just slipped out of him, despite his best effort to keep it in. He immediately looked like he regretted saying anything. I kept asking who they were, but after that one single sentence, his lips were sealed. Days passed and his condition worsened. His skin started to turn a rainbow of colors as it gradually withered away and liquefied, oozing through all the bandages we put on him and separating from his body at the slightest touch. I thought he would scream from the pain more, but most of his nerve endings had already turned to mush. The damage was all over his body, but it was concentrated in his hands and feet, crawling up his arms and legs, leaving his vital organs for last, almost like it was intentionally and cruelly making sure he was alive and sentient for the ruining of his body for as long as possible. We would have never found out who he was or how he got radiation poisoning if his family hadn't randomly shown up on the third day. They had been traveling all over to every hospital in the area asking for a man who had disappeared three days prior. They described the man's appearance in great detail, which meant the man they were looking for was the one who was turning to goop upstairs in the ICU. These days, we might have had to deny them on account of HIPPA regulations, but things were different back then, and everybody in the hospital wanted that poor man to have something good before he died. We allowed his family upstairs to see him, but they couldn't stand to look at him without breaking down into hysterical tears. After the reunion, we asked them for information, and that's when we finally got some. 
He worked for the government as a nuclear waste management worker. He was one of the guys who buried the barrels with radioactive leftovers and had been compiling a long list of complaints against the lack of safety regulations. Unfortunately, he was found out by some government agents who they believe started a fire in his office, destroying all of his work the same day he disappeared. What I gather from that and what he said to me is they forced him to clean up some deadly toxic spill and keep his mouth shut about it unless he wanted his family to suffer similar fates. That explained why he wouldn't tell us anything, but so many things still didn't make sense. But none of it mattered, however. He was terminally ill, but unfortunately, his family wanted us to give him every chance he had to make it out alive. All of us knew this wasn't possible and would only make him suffer more. However, I wasn't prepared for how it would happen. Slowly, the flesh of his arms and legs melted away, exposing his bones, which forced us to amputate. I was assisting the surgeon at the time. I'll never forget how his bones had become. Soft, almost like rubber. After that, he was just a torso and a head, but the horror continued to spread. When it reached his face, his skin melted over his eyes, blinding him. He almost choked on the fluid of his own disintegrating tongue. His gums receded, causing his teeth to fall out. He could still breathe, however, and he had to gurgle and gasp through the goop just to get a breath. Burns are often considered the worst type of damage to a human body to witness, but that level of radiation damage is somehow worse. He was rotting like a corpse, but he was alive. He was still breathing. I can't imagine the mental anguish he was going through that entire time. Trapped in your body as it slowly becomes unrecognizable and eventually everything washes away. The whole time, you can't move or speak and you can barely breathe. And at some point, you can no longer see or hear, but you know you've turned into a grotesque, monstrous looking thing that should never exist and it's the last memory your loved ones will ever have of you. I can only hope he didn't feel any of it, but I'll never know. Finally, after weeks of horror, his family finally agreed to stop trying to keep him alive, and then he was able to die at last. Ever since then, I've had nightmares about it. I think it was the slow progression of becoming an abomination of existence that messed with me the most. Of all the ways to die, that has got to be the worst. <laughs>